In today's video, we're going to be talking about integration. I will also provide um, a couple of examples and also the conceptual framework um, behind integration. So um, in, in basic terms, I would say integration is the opposite of, der um, of derivation. So for example, let's say you were given a function y is equal to 5x cubed. So uh, a, a derivative of this function would be dy over dx is equal to um, 5 multiplied by 3 is equal to 15 and then 3 minus 1 would be 2. So basically when you're doing a, a derivative in this function you are basically taking a general function of the form x to the power n and where n is a constant where you take n and put it in front of x to the power n such that it becomes a coefficient and on n you subtract 1. That is the general rule of differentiation. So integration in this case would be the opposite of this. Um, the exact uh, rule that does the opposite of this particular integration is known as power rule. We will discuss it on part 2. Um, this is part 1. Uh, this is the part one video. So what would you would do here is if you were asked to say um, Integrate this function or any function for that matter. Let's take um, 5x cubed So what you would do would be to take this function and perform the opposite of this. So basically You would just um, let, let me do it here. So this is 5x cubed the integration of this function would be 5x instead of subtracting um, 1 in the exponent you are adding 1 in the exponent so it would be 3 plus 1 and then you would divide um, by the result that you get in the exponent 3 plus 1 instead of multiplying by n in this case you are you are know, dividing by n plus 1 I hope this is clear as a result, you would have something like this as your answer. 5 over 4, x to the power 4. That would be your, your, your answer. But then this is called an indefinite integ integral. So you would need to have a constant there. Because you don't know what this function had um, here before you, um, before you integrated it. I mean, um, the original function. Uh, you, you don't know what number it had here. For example, let's say let's take this function for example here y is equal to 5x cubed so if this function has let's say 7 and you do uh, you perform inter a differentiation on it you would have dy over dx is equal to 15x squared and the derivative of a constant is simply 0 so at the end of the day you would be left with this you would be left with this uh, expression here so that when you integrate this, you know, if you integrate this expression, you should go back to this answer, right? But then what happens is when you integrate this function, you do kind of go back to the, to that answer. This is going to be 15 x uh, to the power 2, 2 plus 1 is going to be 3. And then we're going to divide by the result in the x. Um, but then what happens here is, uh, oh, by the way, 3 goes into 15 5 times, so we're going to get 5x cubed. So you do go back to that answer, but then where is x, where is uh, 7? 7 is a constant that became 0 when you differentiate it. So that's why we have to put a c here, because there is a constant that's supposed to be here, but then we don't know what value it is. It could have been 6. Could have been eight, could have been nine, but either way, it would become zero when you perform differentiation. So that when we integrate again to go back to the original function, we have an arbitrary c um, whose value we don't know. So you have to always put a c there if you're given an, an, an indefinite integral. Okay, now that we know that, um, now that we know that this is uh, an integration, it is the reverse of differentiation. Let's look at it conceptually. Let, let, let's try to get an understanding of what it exactly means to integrate. 
I will first make uh, an example where we have um, suppose we have our Cartesian plane and on this Cartesian plane we have um, this line here let's call it f of x let's call it f of x is equal to 3 where there is 3 here so if you and of course we have 0 and let's say it is 5 um, suppose you wanted to calculate this area below this function you would simply say length times breadth right so it would be area is equal to length which is 5 times breadth I mean the, the, the length in this case we chose length to be 3 3 and then the breadth would be 5 so 3 times 5 is equal to 15 units right? um, 15 square units so this is 15 square units <coughs> but then what if I told you that there is another way of doing this calculation uh, a rather more sophisticated way where you would just simply put this function um, in this manner and get the same answer so let's test if we are gonna get the same answer so what, you, what you're going to do here is you're going to put 0 here and 5 there. These are called integrals, and they are the, basically the x values uh, that uh, in the interval that you're trying to find the area for. So this is x is equal to 0 and this is x is equal to 5. They are x values essentially. And what you will end up with is something like this. This is 3 dx. The integration of this function will is going to give 3x and then 0 to 5 will remain there and then what you need to do is to substitute the value of 5 and then subtract and then substitute the value of 0 in the same expression this way 5 minus 3 times 0 it's the same expression you're just substituting these values here this is going to be equal to 0, this is going to be equal to 15 square units. See, we get 15 square units, it's also 15 square units there. But then a person would look at this and be like, why would you use this weird notation to get the same answer when you could have find it using the, 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 the length times breadth method? Well, the answer to this lies on this imagine you had a curve here and you wanted to calculate the area under this curve that's where this method becomes extremely crucial because because if you're going to be using um, the, this method here it's not going to be possible because this is not a straight line right so um, to, to calculate this area here, let me define this interval from A to B. So if you wanted to calculate this area, what you would do is you would try to approximate it by building or by petitioning rectangles inside it. This would at least give you a reasonable estimate as to what the answer would be for this area. But then this is also not accurate because there's, there's always these small um, areas here that are not accounted for. So for you to account for those areas, you would have to make the rectangles very small. So let's say, for example, um, rectangle 1 will have delta x1. Delta x1 is this length here. And of course, if this is f of x, this length here would be f of x1, right? And this would be delta x2, delta x, delta x3, blah, 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 up to delta xn. And of course, this would be f of xn here, the length here. So, if you, if for example, you want to find this 
area here of this rectangle, you would say um, f of x1 times by delta x1. Just as you would calculate the length, just as you would say length times breadth when calculating the area of the rectangle. But then because this is not L, it's f of x1, you put it there, and this is not B for breadth, you put delta x1 there. This would also give you the area, right? But then you don't have one rectangle, but you have many. In this case, you would need to add them. So you would need their sum. And you would start at x at, 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 at um, i is equal to 1 for the first one, up to xn. So that's the total, right? So that's how you would do. Uh, you, you would calculate the, uh, some of the rectangles. And this would give you a res reasonable estimate as to what the area would be. But then if we if we try to refine this method so that it gives us an even more precise answer, we would say we would would make the rectangles thinner. As we make the rectangles thinner, the number of rectangles would increase. So what we can do is we will try to make the rectangles thinner and thinner and thinner. So in, in other words, making delta x smaller and smaller and smaller. While make, while increasing n to infinity, the number of, um, of, of the rectangles to infinity. So if, if we do this, then we can try to find the limit as n approaches infinity for this um, sum, right? Because this would give us an answer. Let me remove this. The reason we would need to do this is because this would give us an answer of the discrete rectangles, the discrete infinitesimal rectangles that we, uh, that would uh, give the area of uh, the area under the curve when combined. Right. Okay. Now, integration fits in very well here because instead of trying to find the uh, the area of these individual discrete rectangles, we would then try to find uh, to, to to make the whole thing continuous. When you make it continuous, basically you are equating this to the integral a to b of f of x dx. So instead of having delta x there, you're going to have dx to account for the infinitesimally small delta x. Those very, very small delta x's are accounted for by that dx. So you go from discrete to continuous. continuous. So basically that's what uh, uh, an integral does. The in an integral will give you the area below the precise area below the curve, while a derivative will give you the rate of change of the curve at a particular point of interest. I hope this makes sense.